Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Groening. I edit the Working Waterfront newspaper for the Island Institute. And I just want to recognize Galen Koch, who is hiding somewhere in the back and doesn't want to be asked to stand. But this work is very hard, and I think she's done an excellent job with this audio history, this oral history project that she's been doing. And we're going to talk about uh, Portland-specific uh, waterfront development story in a minute. And she, I would direct you to her work. Uh, it's, you can find it online under Casco Bay Stories. And she's done a lot of this work. And as I say, it's a lot harder than it sounds to get people to talk the way they have. And she's actually, I'm a big fan of hers, as are many of the people at the Island Institute. She's been doing work for us and College of the Atlantic through this project. So again, I'd like to recognize her work. So today, the panel we have uh, gathered here, we're going to dive into a specific storm that started about three years ago, and we're going to expand outward. Uh, the storm, many of you who live and work uh, in Cumberland County will remember it three years ago or so. A developer proposed building a 93-room hotel, restaurant, office, and retail space on a wharf here off Commercial Street. Uh, as you can imagine, that it would have impacted the fishing industry in a big way. And, and others who rely on access to the waterfront for recreation and other, other activities. Um, some of the folks on the stage here uh, were directly involved in, in the conflict that inevitably rose over that. Um, and again, we're going to talk about leadership uh, as it emerged collaboratively uh, through this. And, and we're encouraging these folks to talk very frankly about the conflicts that they did work through. And, and they're going to be very polite to each other. Um, but they've worked through and they've developed some real dialogue here. Um, and I'd like them to introduce themselves now quickly down the, starting with Steve. Sure, Steve DeMillo. So I represent my family. We own Long Wharf um, and I've uh, been involved in waterfront zoning and um, all those issues for quite some time now and I'm happy to be here. I'm Cheryl Crowley from Cliff Island, part of the Sustainable Cliff Island Group. I'm Wallace, Wallace Spear. I've uh, been a commercial fisherman and lobsterman for 55 years. I've fished along the coast, the bay, Casco Bay, and Portland Harbor. I'm Meredith Mendelson. <clears throat> I'm the Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Marine Resources, and I serve on the Portland Fish Pier Authority Board. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John Jennings. I'm the city manager in Portland. Um, I also have a part-time job. I work for Willis, whatever he calls. Um, but I also just want to thank the uh, Island Institute for inviting me and for hosting this wonderful forum. Thank you. So the, the developer ultimately abandoned that project. Um, but the part of the story we want, we want to explore is, again, the stakeholders, how they responded. And as Christine said, you know, the idea of leadership has changed, certainly in my lifetime. It's no longer some, somebody charging up a hill and leading the way, as Christine said, it's people getting together and figuring out what do we do? How can we work together? Where do we have mutual interests? Um, and there will always be storms. I think about my 36 years in Maine, uh, and when I first got here, uh, fairly soon we had the condos on Chandler's Wharf, which was kind of a watershed uh, moment in Portland's waterfront history. And, what, a week ago, we learned about a plan. I don't know if you can call it a storm because it can be seen as very good news, but a develop, someone wants to, a philanthropist wants to spend up to $100 million to bring 4,000 graduate students and 300 jobs here. Part of the problem is Portland is such a great place. People want to come here and investment, so it's all your fault. <laughs> so let's dive into this. Let's start with the fishermen. Uh, Willis, I'm going to ask you uh, to, to kick us off here. Um, if the project had been permitted uh, as it was originally proposed, how, how would it have impacted the fishing industry and um, what was their reaction? What sort of responses came to mind initially? Well, uh, first of all, I was hoping I was going to get out of this unscathed, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I can see nope. from the beginning that, yes, we, fishermen, merchants, uh, wharf owners could see that things were changing on Commercial Street. People wanted to be down on these docks that are necessary for our existence. So had it been built, uh, immediately we were worried about the traffic impact. There was going to be a, a garage there. There was going to be uh, 90 rooms and uh, even one more car on Commercial Street that wasn't related to the marine industry had an impact on us. Uh, the traffic would stop. Uh, you couldn't get down to your boat. You uh, just were 
your job, your livelihood became more difficult each day. And this hotel was the lightning rod. We had never had a residence since uh, Chandler's Wharf uh, being one of built on a, on a crowded space as, as Chandler's Wharf was. So we reacted, we, we got to the city, to the councilors, and voiced our opposition because what was gonna happen with that development was gonna have another nail in the, in the coffin of our uh, livelihood. Right. And if you would explain for just briefly, I mean, what, what exactly do fishermen need for a platform? Many of us understand that, but what, what goes on at four in the morning when the rest of us are sleeping? What are you guys doing? What do you need to, to make it happen? Well, the, the wharfs in Commercial Street, that's our office. Without those, without Commercial Street, without those wharfs, we don't exist. Uh, maybe we could make it on a mooring, but you still have to get your product to market. And, and, and Portland and Commercial Street is situated to do that. You can move your product easily to the airport or on 295 and successfully get it to, to, to market. Uh, so we, let's see, I've kind of lost my train of thought about where I was going here, but. Well, just about how, you know, how you need that perch, that, that physical place in the water. Well, that's, that's it, we, we need it. Yeah. Without it, we have no livelihood, right. Sim simple. Okay, let's go to John Jennings. John, the proposal, as I understand it, as it was originally made, would have been allowed, according to the zoning. Um, now people can come to planning board meetings and, and express their displeasure. I, is there a more effective way for the public to, as Willis said, to, to express their displeasure or, or their opposition to something like this that you've seen in your years in municipal government? No, I, I think this is part of democracy. You know, I, we welcome uh, dissent. We welcome support, of course. Um, it is right and proper frankly, for people to come uh, to, whether it be the planning board uh, or the city council, to be able to voice their opinions. I think, though, there were a lot of things that, while Willis and, um, and Keith and many others were working on a referendum, we, uh, sp specifically me, were trying to head off that referendum. And those were the behind the scenes discussions and negotiations and a tremendous amount of learning and listening on my part um, to be able to try to navigate uh, a very difficult situation. Now, as I recall, the referendum would have called for a moratorium on projects. Is that, is that the ref Well, let, let's, actually, let's, let's skip ahead. Um, I understand that I've heard you could tell that you and Willis had a fateful breakfast meeting, except he didn't offer you breakfast. Talk about that. <laughs> Um, well, as I was saying, from, in my position, I have, I have to weigh so many different factors. I have a lot of competing interests that are always coming at me. And I think in this particular situation, I didn't grow up in Maine. Uh, I actually grew up in that landlocked state of Indiana. And, uh, and so I didn't have a lot of experience and, and frankly didn't have a lot of understanding. So for me, in my position, I felt like I needed to intervene um, into work with the city council and the others in, uh, on city staff. So what I did was I wanted, I went to as many meetings, I listened to Willis and Bill Coppersmith who's not here, but Keith Lane who is here and, and many others to, to really learn, to open a, open a dialogue. And so um, I also spent most of my adult life in Boston and I am not terribly thrilled with the way Boston has been overdeveloped over the years, and I don't think any of us in Portland necessarily wanted to have Commercial Street turn into a mini Boston. So there was also, the, my past also informed some of that. But Keith and Willis invited me up to Keith's home, um, up on Waterville Street, and uh, it was a cold, chilly day, much like this. Um, and, and frankly, they didn't know me from Adam, they didn't trust me because I'm with the city. Uh, and there were any number of challenges that we were going to face within the context of those conversations. And you're right, they did not offer me, I don't think even Keith offered me a glass of water if I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we had a really frank and honest conversation and what I was trying to do in, while I was there was to create a space where we could all put everything on the table we could be brutally honest with each other, and that they could begin to trust me. 
And that was really, really important. And I wanted to establish a rapport uh, with them so we could have a dialogue and move things forward. And so that's really kind of, I think, where it all began um, and why we had such a successful outcome um, because of folks like Willis and Keith and many others. I, I think it's telling that you didn't send an email or call. You, I mean, you actually <laughs> made plans to, to meet face to face, which I think is interesting. Uh, and back to Willis once more. Uh, what was your recollection of that moment? Did he get it right or? Well, he's got it right. Uh, although we put him behind the outboard motor that was in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a new one, so it was yeah. fitting. But... It wasn't dripping oil, okay. Oh, but... they, they made it rough, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but it was most unusual to, to have a city manager walk all the way from Chandler's Wharf up Montjoy Hill to meet with us. And we, we were suspicious because we'd been burned so many times before. But we thought that to negotiate with the city was better than a referendum, because if there was a referendum, then immediately the two parties, the city and the, and the folks that put it up, are polarized. Right. And that's the end of negotiation. And Mr. Jennings, to his word, said that we'd discuss things that mattered to us, to the, to the if marine infrastructure and to the character of Portland. And maybe we could get something that would work. And we thought about that. To, to negotiate zoning changes and uh, uh, oh, just the uh, traffic issues was a lot better than doing nothing for five years. So we trusted Mr. Jennings and we put the brakes on the referendum and that referendum had its own momentum that was being pushed by the citizens of Portland. They did not like what they were seeing. And we were the, the poster child for that, not just Irishers, but the people, all the people. Right, you start the ball rolling and it can be taken out of your hands. Right. Uh, it seems to have happened. And, and, uh, but again, let's underscore what he just said, that you began to trust city government because he came and met with you. And, and I think that's, and you know, by taking that step to vote on a moratorium, it, it really casts things I, in, I in a concrete way. I think the other part way. of this is, though, is that we as the city need to, needed to acknowledge and own up to the mistakes that we have made in the past. And, you know, we haven't always done right by the fishing community, um, by harvesters and many others um, in years past. And, and so I think that that is that, that, that area of trust um, once you kind of acknowledge that there have been challenges and frankly the city probably didn't do things the way it, it should have done in the past. But it's a new day, uh, it's a new uh, group in City Hall and certainly a terrific City Council and so that was really I think the, Willis, I think that was where we really got started um, in a more serious way. All right, let's bring in Steve DeMillo. Uh, You've operated, you've been involved in your family restaurant down there on Commercial Street since 1968. I was eight years old washing pots and pans. <laughs> For real. Still wash them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm going to take a, a leap here. I think maybe City Hall has made decisions that haven't sat well with you over the years. <laughs> you know, full disclosure, I, I loved the hotel idea uh, at the, on what we know, knew as Central Wharf at the time. Now it's Chandler's Wharf. Uh, and uh, the Batemans are my friends, uh, but uh, let's make it clear, they didn't uh, take back their proposal. They were sent packing by the neighborhood, by the fishing community, by the city, pretty much everybody. So even though um, I thought there would be a hotel on Long Wharf someday, uh, now I've got to take a different direction. Um, but the, I have to keep going back to uh, uh, Christine's presentation with Puerto Rico. I, I realized it, I'm not going to call Will and his group demons, but I had to treat them like that, and I had to give up to their, uh, to their wants and their ways, and then the collaboration started. So we recognize, and I say we, I represent the other peer owners a lot. Uh, you did hear Charlie Poole in that, uh, in that great recording, uh, and he's known this for many years, uh, as, uh, representing his family on Union Wharf, but the collaboration really happened when, um, when the peer owners stepped back. And we still had a faction that wanted to go to City Hall all guns a-blazing, and it's not my style, and I couldn't sign on that. And uh, we, you know, we, the fishermen and I have been friends since day one, and uh, we still are friends, uh, but we now work together in a more positive way. 
Well, it's interesting that you're saying you acknowledge the opposition, and while you could steamroll over it and say, I'm doing it anyway, you've chosen in, in the Batemans as well. So public sentiment does matter, I guess. Um, and it occurs to me that um, there is this symbiotic relationship between tourism, the business you're in, although you're also in the yacht service and sales business, um, and fishing. I mean, people want to come and sit and look at fishing boats. They don't want to look at mega yachts necessarily. Yeah. Um, but I have, a, you know, I have a brother that uh, thinks that the more traffic, the better. He would say to a fisherman, well, they're coming to buy your lobsters. Quit complaining. <laughs> but it, there's a balance that needs to be struck, and that's what we're, I think we made some huge strides on this last, uh, this last effort and this last go around with the Waterfront Central Zoning. Um, and thanks to the fishermen and John and his crew and the planning board and the counselors, um, I think it was a really, uh, a, again, a collaboration of everybody. I mean, I, we keep, today we've talked about Chandler's Wharf condominium project. We all know that's what happened in 87. It was a pier's edge to pier's edge, can, you know, two, uh, two densely populated uh, condo project, and that's not how the Portland waterfront should, should look like, and it's not the way it's been. When I was a kid, there were all kinds of non-marine businesses that were on the wharves. We talked about it earlier, Willis, uh, Portland, Sebago, Ice and Oil. We bought our salt to make our salt water for our salt water tank when we were across the street at Shirtliff, WH Shirtliff, which was on whatever wharf that was. Union, Union yeah. Wharf, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we've come a long ways. Thanks. Let's bring in Cheryl Crowley. Now, Cheryl, you live in a neighborhood in Portland that happens to be surrounded by water. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> uh, and you've worked on saving a small bit of working waterfront uh, I'm curious, and actually the city played a role in that, um, but let's talk about that. How, how did you provide leadership in, in what could have been a controversial or difficult thing to it? So uh, we, as a uh, group, Sustainable Cliff Island, we're a nonprofit group, and, and we really came from the idea that we are living in a, a fragile neighborhood in the city of Portland, and we needed to create our own infrastructure to, um, to keep ourselves going as a year-round community. Um, right at the beginning of our, our formation, we were um, presented with, um, I would say, a gift from the city of Portland, where a piece of property that was going, um, uh, being taken away for, for back taxes um, was a really pretty key little um, piece of property that had uh, a house, an old store, the fuel business of the island, and a wharf to, the, um, to, to deep water. So it's a pretty key piece of property, and it's really a postage stamp, probably would fit in that corner of the room, but it provides an awful lot of what we need as a year-round community. Um, so working with the city of Portland, we were able to purchase that for a reasonable price, and we're working on that project as we speak. And the city, for its part, could have said, hey, we're selling it to the highest bidder at auction. We have every right to do that, but they didn't. Um, and Cheryl, I think you've mentioned there's a, uh, in City Hall, an island liaison. Can you talk about who that is and how that, how that person helped? At that time, um, our island liaison was, um, was, was uh, Mike Murray, who is a great angel of the islands, and he works behind the scenes very nicely. Um, we haven't, uh, we've had a great relationship with him for many, many years. Um, and he, he finds these little tidbits, and he, and he knows who to connect with in the city and um, help us make that happen. I mean, it was, it was a, a full legal um, process um, with many, many meetings and, and working through all the different departments. Um, but he was, he was kind of our behind-the-scenes person. Um, I talked to John the other day and said, now, now who's our liaison now? And so we need to rework this relationship um, to go forward with some of our issues. And, and maybe that's a lesson to take away, too, that uh, don't wait for the storm to hit to find out who your island liaison is. <laughs> and, and I'm not, I'm not being critical. Love, no, Cheryl. No. <laughs> We've never met before, have we? No. no, no. <laughs> um, seriously, though, you know, you, the inf that's the, the invisible infrastructure that Christine talked about, is find out who your, you know, know who your city councilor is and maybe keep a dialogue going so that when, when things like this happen, you can, you can talk. Let's move to Meredith. Uh, Meredith, you're uh, sort of out of the localness of this, uh, representing state government. You're not, state didn't have a role in what was going on down there on Commercial Street. But maybe you can talk about 
the role that Portland's waterfront plays in Maine seafood industry? Sure. Um, Portland is a critical piece of infrastructure in the state. Um, anyone who knows the groundfish fleet knows that it's really centered in Portland. Um, Portland has landed about $3 million worth of groundfish over the last several years. That's quite a bit lower than we have had historically, but um, it's been relatively stable for the last few years, about 30 boats. Um, 30 boats is about 30% less than we had in 2010, um, and we're down about 50% on landings uh, by both revenue and pounds uh, since that time. But Portland has fared comparatively a lot better than other small ports, particularly related to groundfish. Um, a lot of the other small ports in the state are down to about a quarter of the vessels that used to fish for groundfish and somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15% of the revenue and pounds. So um, it's still really critical infrastructure and I think part of the reason for that is that Portland has the supplies, the ice, the fuel, the net mending uh, yard, um, and a lot of the resources that you know some of the larger vessels in particular need to survive. Um, in addition to that, it's also a really important landing uh, spot for the herring fishery. Again, another fleet that also includes a number of larger vessels. Um, and there, you know, the, that brings in vessels that aren't home ported in Maine um, for the offloading facilities, for the access to transport and to the bait market. So um, it's a unique location compared to the rest of the state. It provides access, particularly for some of those larger vessels. Right. Now, in your role at the Department of Marine Resources, your, your work ranges from Kittery to Eastport. Are there any models, and I hate to put you on the spot with a specific question like this, but any models of cooperation between the fishing or other waterfront dependent industries and uh, government with it, that sort of makes sense to you that you've seen work well? Yeah, this is going to sound um, a little bit like uh, we're all talking from the same um, playbook here, but, and, and I was going to defend my initial comments by saying this, this may sound sort of Pollyanna-ish, but um, now, in light of the conversation that people have had here and, and in light of Christine's comments, I think it's more aspirational than Pollyanna. I think, um, you know, we really have to just sit down and talk to each other one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we have to have a lot of really hard conversations, and, you know, I think... That's not always easy for those of us in government to do. We have structures for the ways that we're supposed to engage with people, and there are reasons for that, fairness, equity, transparency, all valid and important concerns. Um, but at the end of the day, that opportunity to sit down and really engage face-to-face -face and understand what someone's interests are and get past you know, just sort of the 24-hour media cycle and everyone getting their sound bite, really sitting down and talking to someone and understanding what's the most important thing that you need to get out of this um, it is a critical way to move forward. And that's how, you know, even at the state level, that guides a lot of our policy thinking. We have those conversations on a retail basis all the time. I would guess pretty much every fisherman in this room has Pat Kelleher's, uh, the commissioner's cell phone number. Um, we talk to him, uh, the fishermen, fishermen talk to him all the time. Um, we all work with the fishing industry really closely. So I think that kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one engagement really informs how we think about things, because we learn things that we wouldn't learn in a room full of angry people. Right, and we're a small enough state that we can do that. We can pick up the phone, we can contact people, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. Um, Willis, you, in your career, in your 50 plus years fishing, um, you've served on several fishing associations, and fishermen are historically, dare I say it, difficult to mobilize, difficult to get on the same page. Um, <laughs> often suspicious of finding common ground. Actually, if I can just a quick story. I was reading, doing some research for this. The Chandler's Wharf proposal back in the 80s, and some of us will remember that. Um, there was that American Cities Corporation that came in and wanted to do, redo the, the Portland waterfront. And a congressional candidate at the time stood up at a meeting at Boone's Restaurant and said, you know, I was told to stay away from the fishermen, don't use them, they're unreliable. But then I said, Jesus chose fishermen. And everyone <laughs> applauded and clapped. <laughs> And, and, then, and then someone said, yeah, but uh, maybe you met condo developers first. <laughs> anyway, um, it, actually, it's an interesting study, if anyone's interested. The University of Rhode Island did a study about that, the Chandler's War fight, and that whole thing is quite interesting. You can find it online. Um, but Willis, you, you relied on several organizations. You weren't, it wasn't just you and a, and a, 
a clipboard getting signatures. Tell me about the organizations, that, the infrastructure that you relied on, the other fishing groups that you, ha that you leaned on to, to have this clout and how that worked. Well, there was the Maine Lobstermen's Association. Uh, we, we worked with them to help. We, the, they realized that it wasn't just a, a, a Portland problem. It was the coast of Maine. And so they worked with us. They wrote letters. Uh, the Maine Lobstermen's Union, uh, they were involved with this, uh, the waterfront issues. They provided us with lawyers. Uh, the Maine Coast uh, Fishermen's Association, th they did a lot for us. Uh, we had a, a, a little gal called Monique Coombs who would write articles, very good articles, about the issues of communities being pressured by outside development. And uh, Ben Martins, who, when we needed help to, to financially to, to, to pay our lawyers, uh, he helped us that way. Um, other groups was just uh, uh, individuals, uh, you know, uh, there was property owners on Commercial Street came forth, uh, uh, different groups. To, they didn't want to see things change on Commercial Street, or if it was going to change, have it in, in a balance. So. Those groups I mentioned, is, we, we took advantage of that. We, we also had a, uh, a, a videographer who did a video of the, of the Portland waterfront, and, and uh, that got the message out. So the media is important. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so we took advantage of anything we could to get the message out, and, and people from all over the state came to help support that effort. So, and tell me about younger fishermen. I, I think I read that you had said it's harder to get them to, to kind of jump in with both feet on these kind of efforts. Is that true? It, it, they're busy, and, uh, and they, a lot of them don't, haven't seen the history that some people my age have seen, what this waterfront used to be like, and what it could be again. And to lose access to the water, not just fishermen, but po the, the, uh, the local population. To lose that access, would, I think, would be a travesty because I think I read somewhere by 2050 that the world's population will be so great that uh, there's not going to be enough food to feed them. And here, this little city of Portland sits on the edge of one of the richest fishing grounds in the world. Right. And what a shame it would be to lose that. Right. Uh, going it, back to I, you, may John. I, may um, I just jump in on that? Yeah. Because that is so important, I think, for all of us to remember. When we were sitting in the kitchen, and we were talking, and we were, I looked into Willis's and Keith's eyes, and they weren't talking about themselves. They were talking about their children. They were talking about their grandchildren. They were talking about the future of their industry. And that really resonated with me. And I think that that was the thing that really drove home that the city needed to intervene and play a very active role. Because there was such passion and, and emotion that they both felt about the future. And so, for me, that was really the, that moment, because um, it wasn't about them. You know, they've, they've they continued to work, and I think Keith has retired, and, uh, but I think that they were really, really concerned about the future generations, and that really is what animated uh, the work that we were able to do together. And staying with you, John, uh, the city has a waterfront coordinator, which it's too bad that every main coastal town doesn't have a waterfront coordinator. And you've got a very good one in, in my in experience with him. He's very articulate about issues uh, in Bill Needleman. Um, does your city need more of a liaison? Cheryl talked about the, the island liaison. Is that, is that, tell me about how that process works. Um, well, first of all, Bill, I'm not sure if Bill's here. I'm sure he is somewhere. But Bill does an absolutely fantastic job for the city of Portland, and not just the city, for the region, I think for the state. And so we are blessed in Portland to have him. But we also established a working waterfront group that meets regularly with me and other city staff. And so we've put everything on the table. You know, we have area-wide TIFs, tax increment financing districts. One is the waterfront. The, the, the fishing industry have never been invited into the conversation as to how the city spends that money. When that money was specifically designed to figure out ways in which uh, we could, the city could support the working waterfront, but they had never been invited into those conversations. And now we are collaborating, and in fact this past year, 
um, they helped us uh, with proposing in the budget that I brought to the city council specific monies that would um, assist the working waterfront. So there's any number of ways in which Portland or, or any municipality for that, for that matter, you got to invite the conversation though. Mm. You can't do things in isolation. And that is really where I think we're really in a much better place than we were ever before. Mm. Thanks. Uh, Cheryl, people have said, certain people have been quoted in reputable publications such as mine, uh, <laughs> describing you as being successful at herding cats in your, your many, <laughs> many community endeavors by being, and here's the quote from Roger Burley, I believe, um, being quietly persistent. Uh, and I understand how you've done that, but I wonder, is, is there a time in this whole leadership model that we're considering, is, and we're trying to be collaborative, and we're trying to understand each other's needs, and we're trying to reach common ground, is there a time to play the I'm mad as hell card? Sometimes that comes up, <laughs> but I don't get the responses I want. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, we definitely get to that point, and, and, and um, I, I've been thinking about this all along. Um, once a year, the city council comes down to each of the islands to kind of hear us. Well, that's when we play the mad as hell card, and, and we're attacking, and the city council's immediately defensive. I mean, they walk in defensive. They know yeah. they're going to be attacked. So I'd love to see a different way of interacting so that we can be more collaborative, so our biggest concerns are, are really being heard. For instance, parking. You know, we talked about this the other day, but we've been talking about it for years. It's really getting to critical mass as a, a lifeline to, this, to the mainland. To get, when, we, when we reach the mainland, that is a huge issue. Right, and, and you know, that, I know that has been addressed. We, we, I've yeah. covered some of the decisions about that property. There's a undeveloped property down there, and I guess that remains to be seen how that shakes out. Uh, to Meredith, um, as we're talking about this, this access, you deal with policymakers, with state legislators from Western and Northern Maine. Do they get the need for this access that Cheryl's talking about? Yeah, I think um, you know, the people who have coastal constituents, I think, and engage with, um, with you know, unique access issues like island residents or the fishing industry, I think, I think they see the need and I think they recognize it. The challenge, of course, is getting the broader uh, legislature to care. And luckily, you know, a lot of this is often wrapped up in bonding for land for Maine's future. In that context, maybe you're not as passionate about working waterfront, but you are uh, interested in working forests or working farms. Uh, you're interested in, you know, preserving traditional access for recreation. There's often something for everybody in there, um, and that that helps. But um, these are often, you know, unique local issues, and um, so you have to try to package them together in that bigger picture. Right, to build the constituency. Uh, to Steve, uh, you operate, as I said earlier, you operate several businesses on that on that pier. It's not just a restaurant. Um, what are their needs, and and uh, you know, are they recognized? I often say this. I'm I'm not the I'm not the ideal guy to be in this chair. Charlie Poole is. Charlie and his family run Union Wharf, and it's more of a working wharf. My dad bought Long Wharf in 1978. It was derelict. Uh, Willis recently gave me some pictures of uh, what it looked like in 68, and uh, it was sad. But my dad put all of his effort into that property, and uh, I, think, I think it's okay that that's there. It's a mix of marine uses and obviously non-marine uses. And we were treated like that by the city and the planners and the fishermen. When it came time to rewrite these rules, uh, we still are allowed some non-marine use on our property and more than most. Um, and if I'm getting off topic, no, no. you can stop me, but the, our latest go around with uh, waterfront zoning language in, in our central waterfront uh, really uh, I think benefited both parties, the pier owners. Um, they still got the, the areas that are close to Commercial Street, which is now the Commercial Street Overlay Zone, to do non-marine use, but the dockage is now uh, ex ex a void of 50 feet. You can use 50 feet of your dock for non-marine or recreational berthing. The rest of it is saved for uh, commercial berthing. 
of that, the access and operations management plan, which I can't get into detail, but that ensured that the fishing community will have access to the water, place to park their truck, place to at least load and unload their gear. Uh, and I, I think we've struck a great balance, and I think things from now, it'll be a mixed use. So those that want to see, um, I quite often say, do you really want the waterfront like it was in 1972? So that's when I can remember where things were really in a bad shape. And we, and we have a pier. There's still a pier for sale, by the way, on the waterfront if you want to buy one, Custom House Wharf. You know, so, it, was, uh, it was bad. One of the numbers I have that I dug up was there were 14 million gallons of raw sewage a day going into Portland Harbor in 1977. 1977, 14 million gallons of raw sewage. I think there's a technical name for that kind of storm. But... Um, <laughs> And we had one of those open, open, it was called an open box sewer, and the rem remnants of it are still under our pier. It was probably, uh, I don't know, six or eight feet wide and that tall, and it went all the way from Commercial Street to the channel, and that's how sewerage got, and there were several of them uh, along the waterfront. And a National Science Foundation study described Portland's waterfront as the most dilapidated on the East Coast in 1978, the year you're talking about. So those pictures line up with that. And I want to go back to Meredith. Um, because Steve has hit on this, uh, we may be asking peer owners to work against their own self-interest. And, and we, what that means, of course, is that maybe he wants to build a hotel there because it's the highest and best use to maximize revenue for his family business. Um, how, you know, how, do you, how do you get someone to decline that or how do you make the case? It's really tough. Um, we've seen this a lot in the Working Waterfront uh, Access Protection Program. You, you know, you have... Um, certain people who are really altruistic and care about the future access points for their community, um, for their family, for the families that use a wharf, um, and, and they're willing to make that sacrifice. Um, and you know, in a lot of ways, that's part of why through that program, which uh, purchases the development rights and holds them in the state for the ongoing use of that property as a working waterfront, um, you have a lot of cases where co-ops are sort of the best potential candidates for um, using that tool because they have already sort of the broader array of people using a wharf and the you know kind of sense that it may need to carry on for a number of generations. Um, but you know, I think also one thing that um, we've learned through that program is that early on we thought we should be looking for the strongest, best, you know, most um, successful peers to be trying to protect, and that's not always the property that really needs the tool. Um, sometimes that cash infusion is what allows that property to continue to survive and potentially change and thrive um, as circumstances change. So I think, um, you know, we're definitely, we need to think about what is changing, and is that an opportunity to look at a property a little differently, think about whether this is the moment to take that opportunity to protect it or to change the way we're doing something so that we don't lose it completely. Right, I mean, what I'm hearing from you folks too is this more nuanced response to a storm that is development. And, um, and maybe that's something we could take away. That's a lesson that uh, when these storms hit, if you, if you immediately respond and say, this is what we need, this or nothing, um, and then you get into it and you realize you talk to other people and you say, oh, okay, well, if Steve needs to make money, then maybe it, you know, if, if Steve is able to make money, then he can provide something that my business needs, like access. And so maybe it's, it's keeping an open mind, too, as we move forward with these collaborative and not just, I'm going to fight for my, my stake. So we're, we're getting near the end of our time. I thought I'd throw a, a, a quick question, if you would all answer briefly. Um, a couple questions, if we have time. How might finding common ground uh, particularly with this last example we've had for the Bateman proposal. How, how do you get to that faster next time, that, that, that conversation, that, that breakfast meeting that no breakfast was served at? How do you get to those kind of things? Let's start with Steve. I mean, you know, fortunately for this waterfront, that groundwork is laid, so the communication lines are already opened and will continue. Uh, I can't really build on that. Okay, Cheryl? I'm feeling like we need a, a better avenue for that kind of communication because I feel like the islands uh, collectively feel kind of left out of that. And, and it, it impacts us tremendously. It does. I mean, we hear that a lot of that at the Institute, that decisions made on the peninsula affect islands more 
more so than many of us would consider. Willis? We, we the fishermen and some of the merchants realized what, uh, let's, what's at stake. A uh, wharf owner showed me a double wide trailer on his wharf where a float company had rented it for $2,500 a month and they expanded and they left the wharf, went over to South Portland. And it was either a real estate speculator or a stockbroker took the double wide and paid $10,000 a month. Mm -hmm. At this time, there's no way a fisherman can, can afford that type of mm -hmm. uh, money. So when we sit down with the wharf owners, we've done it in a, in a, what do you want to say, a polite way. We understand each other's viewpoints. And sure, there was times when we, it, it got hot in the, in the dialogue, but we respected each other. They respected our presence and what we needed, and we respected what they're facing. And so from that, I, it, it's been a, a good discussion that way. And again, the question, Meredith, is how do we get to that common ground, the collaborative response to a storm more quickly next time? Um, yeah, I, I feel like one thing we all need to do is to try to be um, a little more firm and upfront in our positions when we start talking to people and just lay, lay it out a little faster. I think we could skip a lot of, um, you know, kind of massaging and niceties and um, get yeah, get to the point a little bit faster if we just actually put it out on the table and trusted that someone else was going to give us, you know, a fair shake and, and try to understand why we felt that way and and see if we could find common ground. Uh, that's, I, I think I've seen that operate. That it's better to just to say, look, I need this. You may not agree. You may not be able to give me all of that, but this is what I need. I perceive yeah, we may not agree at the end of the day, but at least right. we know where the other person is, is coming from. Right, that's good. John? And that is certainly the, um, what the way I've approached my job is I, periodically, actually in the beginning, I would consistently get people saying the city is not listening to us. And, and that is absolutely not true. Uh, we are listening, but sometimes because we are the city, we have all these competing interests. Um, it's not that we're not listening, sometimes we just disagree. And so, like with Cheryl, you know, she has said a few things. We are doing our, everything we're, as possible. We have an island liaison. This past summer, um, last summer, we actually created a shuttle uh, for parking on, um, uh, on the peninsula that for islanders specific, that they could park there for free for up to 14 days. And we had a shuttle that ran consistently right to Casco Bay Island Ferry. So we are trying to do things that we can that's within our power. We also don't own all of this land and can build parking garages and, or tear down buildings to provide islander-specific islander parking. Because I know that's one of the challenges. But we try to do our, we're trying to do our best by looking at ways in which um, we can address these problems, but also, as you just said, we often ha are put in a position where we have to say this is what we can do and this is what we can't do. Um, we have so many challenges. Just this past month, the, we were talking about how in the city of Portland, we have over $100 million in needs in just sidewalks. <laughs> Only um, less than 89% uh, of our sidewalks are not ADA compliant. And, and so when you think about all of those financial challenges that we have, and that's not even talking about streets, right? So there's all of these challenges that we face, um, and it was, we're just trying to balance it all. Mm -hmm. Well, you, if I could just quickly please. add, what the city manager created was the waterfront work group with his representatives of both sides sitting at that table, and we meet on a regular basis. We met this past week, so. Thank you for bringing that up. That's right. I mean, that's a, a, a huge, Deal that you guys are meeting regularly. I got invited to one of the meetings. I have to go. It would be fascinating to listen to. So let's give these folks a hand. And we'll try the, the questions. Um, if this doesn't go Iowa caucus on me, let's see. Yeah. Um, Has the, opportunity, has the Opportunity Zone legislation affected Portland and potential other waterfront projects? I'll throw that to John. The Opportunity Zone legislation, is that still in place? Uh, it is. Uh, the, this was something that the Trump administration moved forward in support with the previous governor. 
Um, we had proposed different locations in the city of Portland for the oppor opportunity zone, such as Bayside. Uh, the previous governor decided to choose the waterfront. Um, and so there is a, a, a process that someone could come forward with, but we have not seen a project yet that okay. takes advantage of any of that. Uh, has the city considered building a city-owned and operated waterfront facility to support the fishing community for decades to come while permitting more development? In other words, why not have the city have a stake in, in uh, I mean, in Canada, they do that. They invest in, in public in infrastructure for the fishing industry. Is that something that's crossed your radar? Well, we do have the Fish Pier, um, which is not wholly owned by the city, but that is an independent board and so forth governs that. But that is something that um, many years ago, the city uh, decided to invest in. There actually was, interestingly, uh, in our most recent meeting, there was a discussion about maybe a facility, um, because we've been talking about the the craziness that is Commercial Street and how we're looking at, uh, holistically, we're looking at changes on Commercial Street. And so um, the idea was maybe to create a central receiving area for deliveries hmm. that would prevent Federal Express and all of these trucks and everything else coming down Commercial Street. Therefore, the businesses or peer owners or others um, could go and get their own deliveries. Hmm. I thought that was a very intriguing idea. And so there's... We're looking at anything and everything. That is interesting. I have a question for Meredith. Uh, can you talk about the challenges and opportunities related to rebuilding Maine's ground fisheries? Piece of cake, right? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Thanks for that one. Um, <laughs> it wasn't me. Yeah. It's anonymous. <laughs> uh, you know, it is, um, it is a really, it's been a really long slog for the ground fish industry, and uh, it's, not, it's not over. We're actually in the middle of a really difficult and controversial amendment um, to introduce electronic monitoring and increase monitoring generally uh, in the ground fish industry, um, following on some very public, maybe you saw the stories about the cod father um, uh, issues in, in, um, and cheating in, in the fishery. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities still for trying to change the way we've um, we've often landed fish in, in Maine and in other places in the ground fish industry. Um, you know, stocks are in debatable shape and the quotas are low on a lot of the stocks that historically Gulf of Maine fishermen have targeted. Um, and so we really need to increase the value for those fish. Um, that in and of itself is not a simple challenge. The fish exchange had a role in that at one time and has been less successful in achieving that in sort of the competitive marketplace in the last few years. And that, um, that makes it tough for Maine fishermen. We see people pursuing opportunities to get greater value by selling and marketing their own fish uh, as line caught or um, you know, somehow sustainably caught. And um, those are great opportunities as well, but they don't um, take advantage of some of the really healthy stocks that we have offshore um, that can be brought in in larger volume. So hmm. I don't have a great answer. We're trying to think creatively about how we keep the fleet that we have in Portland, in particular, uh, the diversity of that fleet, and um, preserve the infrastructure that we need by trying to you know, create a mix that everybody can take advantage of in other fisheries and potentially in aquaculture so that that fleet can survive as it waxes and wanes. But it's, um, it takes the creativity of a lot of people and there is no one more creative than fishermen. So I have faith that we'll have a ground fish industry in this right. state for a the long time. Creativity in the marketing, what they rebranded dogfish. Something that's, yes, Cape that's, Shark that's smart in Cape Cod, yep. Okay. <laughs> Uh, here's a couple of good ones here. Um, lobstermen and aquaculture farmers want to use the same seabed and be near the same terrestrial infrastructure. Are there examples of balancing those interests? And I'm not sure, is that a narrative question probably? I'm sorry, you can you say the beginning again? Sure, lobstering and aquaculture uh, entrepreneurs <coughs> want to use the same seabed and be near the same terrestrial infrastructure. How, you know, how do you balance? That, that's obviously something that's bubbling up now more and more potential conflict. And actually, that's a really good example. Whoever asked this question, that is maybe the next storm. It is, uh, it is certainly a hot topic right now. Um, I think we, we just have to, again, those are, those are tough conversations. We need to sit down and have them openly and honestly. Um, 
we've been trying to engage in that conversation. Um, you know, certainly there are a number of places that that's happening outside of state government, um, but we're also trying to have that conversation. I met with um, the Zone F, which includes Casco Bay uh, Lobster, Lobster Zone Council, back in the spring to talk about this very issue. Mm -hmm. And I think lobstermen certainly um, have some very valid concerns with the ways that they're seeing use change in the Bay. Um, at the same time, there are also a lot of people who are um, getting into an industry that has an optimistic future, and that includes a lot of fishermen, including right. a lot of lobstermen. So it's a diversification opportunity that we also need to, to make space for. Great, I mean, how about one more? Uh, and maybe anyone can jump in on this. What does it take to stop the fight and start the dialogue? in storms that have already started brewing. I mean, we've been touching on that, but is there one, and I, I've heard a lot of good things here. I've been very pleased with some of the things, being honest about what you want, um, talking face to face. Um, it's been good stuff here. But to stop the fight, I mean, Willis, you talked about, you know, had that referendum petition been submitted, you know, it's kind of hard to stop the fight at that point when it's on the ballot. Right. Um, is there a point at which you can pull back or, well, there's always a point, you know, when you, but to, if, if these arguments start at the grassroots, and that's when the best dialogue is, talking to Steve or talking to John, but when it, it gets top heavy, when it, it comes in from uh, uh, someone's already gonna take it, you know, it's, it's already a done deal, then the di there's no dialogue, then. Right. then that's when you see referendum. So it's important that government work from the ground up. Mm. Well, thank you all. I'm sorry, Steve. Yeah, it it doesn't really address that question that there was submitted, but no, none of us have talked about jobs. I mean, this is the jobs that exist on the Portland waterfront. It's, own, it's like its own little economy. Uh, you know, we, ser we sell fuel to the fishermen. We sell their lobsters. Uh, we all support each other. And it's just striking that balance so everybody's going to be happy in that little um, microcosm is the challenge. I mean, Portland is such a success story uh, in, in Maine. Uh, when I was working for the Bangor Daily News, I remember covering, there was a legislator from northern Maine that wanted to secede the northern part. Greater Portland generates 40% of the tax revenue to the state of Maine. It, it's incredible. And, um, you know, obviously all the, the activity that you're talking about, I mean, that's, that's a huge part. And everyone wants to be here. My son's friends are here. My daughter and her husband, they want to be here. You've got, you've created problems by being such a successful city. Um, the other interesting number that I found in doing some research, that if Portland were in Massachusetts, God forbid, um, <laughs> it would be the 15th, I think, largest municipality between Haverhill and Framingham, believe it or not, at 66,000. Here's another bit of a uh, number that's kind of cheering. Um, median age in Portland is 36.1, and the state is 45.1. So, so us older folks up here don't represent the, the true Portland. But let's give these folks a hand. And